This podcast contains sensitive topics and discussions. Listener discretion is advised. A college woman's brutal rape leads to a 40-year quest for justice, revealing that there was more than one victim in this case. This is the Alice Seabold story. Hi, Amy. Megan, I know that name. I know you know this name, and I knew you would. I don't know the whole story, but I am extremely interested because I've heard tidbits. Yes. I saw your face light up that you recognized it, because we often don't know each other's cases either. I also want to say that today's case was suggested by a listener, Emma E. Now, Emma said that she went to our recommended reading list to find a book, but noticed another one of interest to her. Now, the reason she was interested was because the writer had recently been in the news for her involvement in an older sexual assault case. Emma had some great questions on topics that we discuss regularly, including the reliability of certain evidence, eyewitness identification, parole policies. I mean, she had some great topics for discussion. So I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. So we would like to thank Emma for her suggestion, as well as everyone who's written in with these great cases. We review them all and we do our best to include your suggestions in our choices. And some of you might already know about this case. I'd heard of it, but I didn't know the entire story. And neither does Amy. So let's begin by meeting the subject of today's episode. Alice Siebold was born on September 6, 1963, in Madison, Wisconsin, to mother Jane and father Russell. Alice was the second child and had an older sister named Mary. Alice's mother was a local journalist, and her father was a professor of Spanish literature. The family moved a few times as her father worked at different universities, and we know how that goes. You know, there's only a certain number of university positions in a certain area. Do you remember as you were applying, like when when I was applying, there was only three that would have kept me within... Two hours of New York City. Yep, same. And for me, I was looking, I know you were looking at other states, right? But for me, I wanted to stay in the tri-state area. So there were very few options. I sort of looked at other states, but I really, I I didn't mind leaving the tri-state area, but I didn't really want to relocate so far. But yes, so it's a challenge. And people do tend to move around in university positions. After a few of these different positions, Russell got a long-term track at the University of Pennsylvania. Seems like I'm covering a lot of Pennsylvania lately. I don't know if I'm drawn to that because it's my (laughs) home state now. But anyway, he moved his family to Paoli, Pennsylvania, where they made permanent residence. Unfortunately, around this time, Alice's mother began drinking very heavily. And she was, for all purposes, a functional alcoholic until 1977. But even after she'd gotten sober, she still had a number of issues, suffering from severe anxiety and panic attacks. And due to these issues, Alice and her sister Mary spent most of their childhood being their mother's caretaker because she really couldn't take care of them or herself. But despite a difficult childhood, Alice was a bright young woman, Although Mary was the academic who garnered most of the attention with her straight A's and her college ambitions. So it was no surprise when her older sister Mary decided to attend the same college their father taught at, University of Pennsylvania. Now, Mary is a great academic, but as we know, when you are employed at a university, one of the benefits and the reasons why some people take positions is because your children can attend the college for free mm-hmm. or at a you know substantial discount. So I imagine that's why Mary also went to University of Pennsylvania, which is a good school as well. Mm-hmm. Now, Alice was not like her sister. And although she was very bright, she wasn't really that interested in college. She was, you know, from this academic family. And I think that she felt some pressure to follow in her sister's footsteps So she applied to three colleges. Even though she wasn't super interested, it was just an expectation that she would go. She applied to Syracuse University, Emerson College in Boston, and the University of Pennsylvania, of course, as her safety school and because her parents wanted 
her to apply there. Safety school. That's such a good school. That would definitely have been my reach school, not my safety school. Oh, that would have been my reach school probably too, (laughs) just so you know. But I think for her, it was safety because she knew that she could attend there because of her father. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she didn't, going to University of Pennsylvania meant Commuting instead of living on campus. And Alice really didn't want to do that. She wanted to leave. So she ended up picking Syracuse. Now, Alice wasn't initially super comfortable at Syracuse, but that may have just been the usual freshman jitters being away from home for the first time. There are many reasons why people aren't comfortable. I can tell you that I was immediately comfortable away. Me too. I I liked it. (laughs) Me too. But pretty quickly, she began to make friends in her dorm. In particular, she became very close with a girl named Mary Alice, who also, I guess Alice had described Mary Alice as one of the kind of popular pretty girls. She didn't feel that comfortable at Syracuse initially. And I think the girls kind of bonded over this. And, you know, soon they were sharing their deep truths, their feelings, and they became good friends. Do you realize her friend's name is her name and her sister's name? Did you not get that? Nope. I should have immediately got that. But yes, Great observation, and I didn't even think of it. Alice also began to take poetry classes, which she loved, and she became close with two of her writing classmates. She attended parties, and she did a lot of, you know, normal freshman activities. And while things were seemingly shaping up to be a good first year, the events of one evening would completely change everything. In the spring of 1981, on one of the last nights of her freshman year, Alice was walking back to her dorm and had to go through a tunnel near campus. This was actually a tunnel to an older amphitheater. Before she knew it, a man grabbed her from behind and ordered her to come with him, telling her, I'll kill you if you scream. Now, she screamed anyway, but he covered her mouth and threatened her with a knife. He then proceeded to beat Alice, and though she put up a fight, pushing him and fighting with her hands, Her assailant overpowered her by sitting on her chest and slamming her head into the concrete until she stopped fighting. Yes, this is a brutal, brutal attack. From there, Alice pleaded, explaining that she was a virgin and begging her assailant not to sexually assault her. But Alice's pleas fell on deaf ears as her assailant not only raped her, but verbally degraded her through the entire ordeal. He even urinated on her, blaming her for his inability to stay erect. Alice recounts these details in her memoir, Lucky, with vivid recollection. More on that later. Before her assailant let her go, though, after this vicious attack, he began apologizing, calling her a good girl and saying he was sorry. A terrified Alice asked to pick up her things and go, to which her assailant said, okay. He said he would see her around. A bloody, battered, and traumatized Alice walked back to her dorm, where she immediately reported to residential security that she had been sexually assaulted and needed to go to the hospital. So Alice was quickly taken to the hospital. At the hospital, Alice had to undergo forensic testing to collect evidence, which I'm sure, and I've heard, is, you know, traumatizing for victims as well. The police were there. But Alice's nurse did her best to shield Alice from the police officer on the scene at the time because Alice was so uncomfortable. But I'm sure it was still uncomfortable nonetheless. As Alice went through the exam, they found that there was a piece of skin under her nails. And the nurse said, good, you got a piece of them. Photos were also taken of her extensive injuries. She was bruised, battered, bloody. And afterwards, Alice did a full interview with the detectives. Now. This is where the title of her memoir comes in. One officer in particular told Alice that she was, quote, lucky because a girl the prior year to her had been murdered and dismembered in the same area as her. So Alice was lucky to have only been beaten and raped. Imagine telling a rape victim she was lucky. Um, Yeah, I'm sure she didn't feel very lucky. No, she did not. In fact, at one point in her book, I read that she felt she had much more in common with the dead girl than she did with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And again, hence the name of her book. This was also in the 1980s, so we will discuss then and now. Despite the tone deafness of police, Alice helped a forensic sketch artist make a composite sketch before going back to her dorm to clean out her room for the summer. And the next day, Alice went home. Her parents came to get her, her mother. Now, Alice's parents knew what happened to her, 
And while they were supportive of her, it also seemed that they were a bit inept when it came to figuring out how to handle the situation. Her mother was not a caretaker. And on one of the first nights at home, her father, he wanted to discuss it. Now, he he asked her why she hadn't run away from her assailant when her assailant put his knife away. So her father was confused because Alice did report that her assailant had a knife, but he had to put it away at some point. And her father said, well, why didn't you run? Now, Alice was sitting there and her mother and sister were so angry at her father for even saying this. But Alice said that she simply took her dad aside and said, I want to do the best to answer your questions. So why don't you just tell me what you don't understand? And he said he didn't understand why she wouldn't run. And she said, you know, that she had to explain that she was beaten and that she was terrified and she was afraid that she was going to die. So, you know, being afraid for her life, she just wanted to survive. She said she she recalled that she doesn't even know how she had the patience to explain it to her father. But she remembered thinking that she just had to answer his questions so that he would understand why she couldn't have run. I think we know a lot better now as well. Mm -hmm. But kudos to her for, you know, taking that approach and and really trying to explain this to her father instead of just the initial anger that she might have felt. Alice stayed at home that summer trying to heal and figure out what she would do in the fall. But she chose to go back to Syracuse for her sophomore year. Reason why is she said she could not imagine staying at home with her parents. And so she went back a new dorm, some new poetry classes, Mary Alice, and some new and old friends she made. But just when things were getting back to normal, Amy, Alice spied her rapist one day on the street when she was walking back to campus from lunch. Wow. Yes. This was in October. And a young black male walked towards Alice, according to Alice, as she walked down the street and she heard him say, Hey girl, don't I know you from somewhere? Alice was stunned. This was the man who raped her and he was talking to her like nothing had happened. She was too afraid to yell out for help because uh, apparently there was a police officer right there. So she quickly walked back to her campus seeing a professor. In fact, she had a famous professor. Have you heard of the famous poet Tobias Wolf, writer? Yes, of course. Uh, she had another, a couple famous professors, Tess Gallagher as well, but it was Tobias Wolf who she wa- she had class with him and she felt that she needed to go tell him why she couldn't be in class. So she went to him and she said that she could not go to class because she had just seen her rapist and she had to go to the police station. Wolf was reportedly very sympathetic and offered to take her or help and support her in any way. Alice called Syracuse City Police, who arrived shortly after. And they took Alice, along with a friend, back to the area to see if she could still identify her rapist, you know, if he was still in the area. Alice was able as well to make a sketch of him. So when she had gotten back to her dorm room before the police arrived, she sketched him herself. And so this sketch was taken. I don't know if they they worked on the sketch as well with her or if it was just her original sketch, but it was distributed. Though the man was gone when Alice and the officers returned to the area, Other officers were provided with this description of him, and I guess maybe the sketch, and the time and place where Alice had seen him. And based on the information Alice provided, one of the officers said he knew the suspect and that he had actually spoken with him that day in that very place. He recognized him from the sketch? From the description, the sketch, the time, and the fact that he had a conversation with him because he knew him. Okay. Who was the suspect? He was a man by the name of Anthony Broadwater. The officer, as I said, knew him, but not because of like any real criminal activity. According to one officer, Anthony was just a friendly young local. He had a lot of brothers as well. I think they had gotten into maybe some childhood trouble, but nothing too serious. But if he had raped Alice, he had to be arrested and he was picked up immediately and brought down to the police station. The police felt confident that they had their man. Now, after Anthony's arrest, the police needed Alice to pick him out from a lineup. And this would become the source of much controversy later on. Why? Well, let's begin with the lineup. It consisted of five black men, all similar to the physical description Alice had provided in the spring of 1981, and she had to identify her assailant. So this was a live lineup. Anthony Broadwater was in position number four. 
But Alice identified her assailant as the man in position number five. Mm -hmm. You think this might exonerate Anthony, but the police told Alice afterwards that she picked the wrong man. Which is like, I'm sorry, but that is the biggest, you know, I I studied, I went as identification for my thesis and, Mm -hmm. you know, post-identification feedback is one of the most harmful things an administrator could do because I'm assuming that led her to change her choice. Well, let's just say it did influence her choice. But first, Anthony, he found himself indicted for sexual assault, among other offenses, after a grand jury met in November of 1982. Now, he emphatically denied any involvement in the crime and opted to go to trial. This was after the lineup? Yeah. The only evidence they had to secure the indictment was the identification? At this point, yes. His attorney felt, well, th- there was, um, sorry, there was also hair evidence, which I'll discuss in a moment. Okay. His attorney felt, though, that he had a good case for a bench trial. And a bench trial just means in front of the judge because he felt, you know, there was an incorrect identification and very weak evidence, really very little forensics. So the trial commenced in May of 1983, but it lasted for just two days. The only forensic link the prosecution had was hair analysis which has largely been discredited now. But at the time, an analyst for the crime lab said that the hairs recovered from Alice were consistent with those from Anthony. But consistent was the strongest he could say, Amy. You're shaking your head. Because, I mean, hair comparison is now considered a junk science, unless it has a root that has DNA. Correct. But that was not the case in 1982. Mm -mm. This was simply about looking at the hairs. Also in question was the fact that Alice had not picked Anthony out of the lineup. However, she now felt it was Anthony. Let me tell you this. Alice's testimony was strong and she had a seemingly good explanation for why she had not picked Anthony. She said that for her on this day, it had come down quite squarely to number four and five. She knew she believed it was one of them. Turns out, interestingly, those two were friends, which is kind of odd. They knew each other. But anyway, she said she was torn and that number five, while she was looking, stared straight up at her and was looking right at her, which frightened her. And so she panicked and picked him. She said that she knew she made a mistake once she left the room, which is why she said it was. She said that afterwards, she's like, it was number four, wasn't it? And so she felt that she made this mistake right away, according to her. I will say, even though she had a mistaken eyewitness identification, Alice came across as a very strong witness. Prosecutor said one of the best he had ever had in terms of a victim who testified. She was clear. She was articulate. She didn't buckle under pressure. And the judge seemed pretty sympathetic to her. Even speaking, get this, with her and her father outside of the courtroom during a break, during the trial. That's not allowed, is it? No, this is a big no, no. This is, uh, would this be an ex parte communication? I think that's what it would be called. I know that happens when judges converse with the lawyer outside, but we're talking about the actual um, victim in the case. Nevertheless, after the defense rested, the judge deliberated and found Anthony Broadwater guilty of Alice's rape and sentenced him to eight to 25 years in prison. I'm assuming he didn't have an alibi? No, he said he was in the area that day. Okay. You mean for the, uh, you mean an alibi for that or the alibi for the assault? Sorry, an alibi for the night of the assault. I don't think he had an alibi or if he did, I don't know what, you know, the alibi was, if it was something that was verifiable. It's also, remember, 1981, we don't have cell phones, Mm -hmm. we don't have other things, you know, surveillance. His sentence of eight to 25 years, I'd also like to point out, is during the time of indeterminate sentencing. So post 1980s and 1990s, we have determinate sentencing now, which means that we have more fixed sentences, smaller sentencing ranges. You have to serve 85 percent of most sentences now. But in the time, indeterminate meant a more open sentence, which means that after eight years, he could be eligible for parole, but could serve up to 25 years. That's a very, very wide range. For Alice, justice had been served, and she tried to go back to her life as best as she could. She graduated from Syracuse, although she would suffer another blow while at school. A very close friend of hers, one with whom she shared a very strong bond, was also sexually assaulted at Syracuse. And this was also a stranger assault in her home. Alice was a good friend in every way, but her friend pulled away saying she felt weird because she didn't want to talk about it. I guess Alice did want to talk about it and this woman wanted to put it behind her and forget that it happened and now it made her uncomfortable. 
to be friends with Alice. Alice said that she was heartbroken that this friend never spoke to her again after they graduated, feeling that they were almost as close as sisters. Nevertheless, Alice had no choice but to move forward. And so she enrolled at the University of Houston's graduate program to study poetry. But after a short time there, she decided she was done with academics. And so she moved to New York City. This is New York City in the 80s, too. She drifted there for a while, residing in low-income housing. I think she lived on the Lower East Side. It was particularly harsh then. You know, the 80s were a time, I think, we can agree the 80s were kind of the gritty city time. Mm-hmm. And so the the crime rate was high. I think the Lower East Side especially, right? Oh, in particular, but many areas. Mm-hmm. Times Square, yeah. I mean, you had Needle Park. Like, this was drugs, crime, subway graffiti. This was, you know, hardcore. But she was teaching at Hunter College for a little while. I taught there for a bit as well. Saying later that her students there really kept her alive. While teaching, she wrote a personal essay about her experience as a rape survivor that got featured in the Times. The essay actually garnered her an invite to the Oprah Winfrey show to discuss her experience. Did you know this? I didn't remember this. Yes, I remember the article and I remember the episode of Oprah. Do you really? Oh, that's incredible. Okay, I did not. Later, this essay was quoted in the book or featured in the book Trauma and Recovery by Judith Lewis Herman. It was, you know, a significant accomplishment. But Alice was suffering from a serious drug problem around this time, becoming reliant on heroin and unhealthy relationships until she realized that she had to get out of New York City in this pattern. So when an opportunity came along for Alice to spend a few months at an artist colony in California, she took it. While there, she enrolled in a new writing program at Irvine in California. And this time, she stuck with it. In this program, she began writing a book about a young girl who was looking down from heaven as her family and friends coped with her disappearance. But she put the novel aside, though, at that time to write her own personal memoir. She titled the memoir Lucky, and it was published to noteworthy praise in 1999, though it wouldn't become a bestseller until much later. You see, after Lucky came out, Alice returned to the novel she'd begun during her program at Irvine. And what novel might that have been, Amy? Well, I'm going to guess that was Lovely Bones, which then became also a hit movie. That is correct. The Lovely Bones was the one that gained real praise and real attention. The Lovely Bones is a fictional story that follows 14-year-old Susie Salmon, who's raped and murdered by her neighbor, neighbor who covers up the crime and hides Susie's body. Susie watches from a place that isn't quite heaven but close, in a suspended state, having trouble letting go of her human life and watching as her family falls apart, unable to find their daughter and her friends grow up without Susie. It's a harrowing tale of cruelty, pain, and sorrow mixed with promise and hope. It sold over 10 million copies worldwide, and I'm sure many of our listeners have read it or watched the movie version, which you referenced. The movie came out in 2009. It was directed by Peter Jackson and starred some pretty famous actors, Rachel Weisz, Susan Sarandon, Mark Wahlberg, Stanley Tucci, and Sorsha Ronan. So that was also a big hit, and I watched the movie after I read the book. The success of The Lovely Bones also led to a renewed interest in Lucky, which went on to then sell over one million copies. During this success, Alice married, though she would later divorce, and then she wrote another novel, The Almost Moon. So some might say case closed on this story. Nope. But not so fast. To understand what happens next, we have to go back to Alice's convicted assailant, Anthony Broadwater. Anthony was born and raised in Syracuse, New York, along with his five brothers. So there were six boys in total. Can you even imagine? That poor mother. (laughs) Well, unfortunately, it was sad. His mother died when he was, when Anthony, the fourth child, was just five years old. So tragic. Um, So it was a tragedy. If I recall, I think it was a serious case of pneumonia. It was some illness. Raised by his father, Anthony might have been known, as I said, to local police for some adolescent trouble, but he never committed a crime, not an adult crime and nothing serious. He joined the Marines when he was just 17 years old. However, his dream of being a Marine was cut short when he received a medical discharge because he had, I guess, a substantial cyst in his wrist. 
which would obviously impact his abilities, you know, with firearms and other things that would be required of service. He returned home to Syracuse and took a job working in telecommunications, installing telephones. And as I said, Amy, he had been on Marshall Street where Alice Siebold saw him on October 5th, 1981. But when he'd said, don't I know you? He said that he wasn't speaking to Alice. He was speaking to a police officer he knew who'd been nearby. Remember, this was the officer who recalled this event as well. Mm -hmm. So when he was arrested some days later, Anthony Broadwater was shocked to find out that he was being arrested for sexual assault and was later even more shocked to have been convicted of this serious crime. While in prison, though, Anthony obtained his GED. Remember, he didn't finish high school because he enlisted in the Marines when he was 17. He also studied the law, which a lot of prisoners will do to work on their own cases or just to understand more about the process. Unfortunately for Anthony, his father developed stomach cancer and passed away in 1983 while Anthony was still incarcerated. Anthony had multiple parole hearings. However, he would not admit guilt for a crime he'd said he did not commit. And so Anthony served 16 years before he was granted parole. And that was only because of his exemplary record. And Megan, you remember in past episodes, we talked about the issue with measuring rehabilitation by one's remorse. Yes, absolutely. Forget which episode, but it's come up well, we've in We've talked the past. about it before, and we're going to talk about it in the discussion because I'm not done with that. But he, he likely served eight more years than the eight initially because he would not admit to a crime he said he did not commit. He couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. After release, Anthony found reentry quite difficult not just because of usual re-entry problems that many parolees face, but remember, he had to register now as a sex offender because he had a sex crime, which placed many constraints on places he could work or even visit. You know of the many limitations. Jobs were hard to come by, and at the time of his release, Anthony Broadwater still wanted to clear his name as he was really suffering the stigma that comes with being labeled as a sex offender. Now, he had met someone, a family member introduced him to someone after he was released, a woman by the name of Elizabeth, who developed a relationship and she became his girlfriend. And with his help, the two prepared to fight for Anthony's name. So he was lucky in the fact that he did have family, brothers, cousins, and he also had a devoted partner. And they would have some luck here, Amy, because in 2018, Alice's memoir, Lucky, had garnered some interest with movie producers who wanted to adapt it into a film. However, when they started looking into it, there were some who doubted that Anthony Broadwater was guilty. You're saying some of like the Hollywood producers started questioning it? Yeah, some of the people involved in the project financing. They saw some of the holes. First of all, there was the fact that Anthony hadn't been identified by Alice as the perpetrator. And although she'd explained it, he was not identified. There was also no real evidence to suggest he was guilty except for those hair strands. And the best they could say from them is that they were consistent. There was no match. There was no science. And I held this part back, but I'll tell you now that Anthony passed two polygraph tests. We know they are not infallible, but certainly when you have doubt, they're helpful. And lastly, Alice Siebold, as I said, admitted that she made a mistake on the lineup, along with the details about how the prosecution kind of coached her to speak about it during court. Now, she says she was telling the truth about what happened, but there was some suggestion that the prosecution was helping her to rehab her version and explain it so that, you know, it made an impact. So there were a lot of issues. Needless to say, after a couple of years, the film deal died on the table because of the concerns that, you know, they'd be further perpetuating a potentially untrue story. But the questions surrounding the whole thing garnered some legal interest by defense attorneys who wanted to help Anthony Broadwater. And he was very happy to have the help. Amazingly, his defense attorney's arguments were quickly met with agreement from Syracuse's district attorney. This was interesting. He said that he ordered any convictions involving hair sample analysis to be reviewed by his unit and reported. However, he said Anthony's case had not been included. Now, did they have like a conviction integrity unit or conviction review unit? Do you know? I'm not positive if they had that, but I think so, because this was in, you know, 2021 and he had ordered okay. it just before then. So I'm going to yeah. assume they did have that. If not, he's a progressive DA and wanted to make sure that they didn't have wrongful convictions in the unit or that they could find justice. So Anthony's case was reviewed. And amazingly, and very quickly, in November 2021, 
the joint motion by the defense and the state was granted and Anthony Broadwater was officially exonerated. He held his head in his hands and cried. A very moving moment. Did they have DNA evidence to test or they just dropped it based on insufficient evidence? I don't know what DNA evidence they have, but I do know that they have some. They definitely have skin. Remember, she got, Mm -hmm. she scraped. And I don't believe that he wore a condom. So I do believe that DNA evidence exists and they could still test it. I would assume if they were so quick to overturn, they probably had some pretty strong evidence that he was not the perpetrator. That's why I asked. Well, I don't know if they have anyone else in sights. If they do, they've remained quiet on that. But I believe they felt, based on the fact that there was a a mistaken eyewitness identification and no real other evidence, that it was, Mm -hmm. you know, a travesty of justice. So Anthony was exonerated. He was, you know, he's had a really tough road, but obviously he was very happy to be exonerated in the public. Alice Siebold issued some public statements to address this finding, apologizing to Anthony and claiming she truly did not know he wasn't the person who raped her. She said the following days after the exoneration, quote, I am sorry most of all for the fact that the life you could have led was unjustly robbed from you. And I know that no apology can change what happened to you and never will. She wrote further, my goal in 1982 was justice. Certainly not to forever and irreparably alter a young man's life by the very crime that had altered mine. Now, some have criticized Alice's apology as empty, saying that she made millions off of his misery. She hasn't met him in person. But what did Anthony Broadwater think about the public statements? Because he's the one who Mm -hmm. (laughs) is the most important here. Can I just say? Yes. I think it's I think it's important because this reminds me of Jennifer Thompson. And we covered that case as well with Ronald Cotton. And I think it's very, very important that we recognize that this man was a victim of wrongful conviction because of the system, not because of the eyewitness. Absolutely. And I think we should talk about this, you know, why she was so sure it was him when we talk about eyewitness identification Mm -hmm. briefly again. But yeah, this wasn't Alice's fault. This wasn't malicious. In response to her statements, Anthony Broadwater has said, quote, I thank the good Lord I made it to a point where I'm strong enough mentally to say, hey, it was the court. It was the system. It's not the victim's fault. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Really, really such a good guy, right? Mm -hmm. The book Lucky is no longer being distributed by the publisher. When asked if she would revise the book, Alice said, quote, to do justice to the new reality and all the ramifications of the past would be a huge undertaking. It might also be amazing. So we have yet to see if Alice will, in fact, rewrite the story or rewrite the ending to include the reality of what now has transpired. So I read the book, but it's been so many years I don't remember. I'm assuming she names Anthony in the book. Is that why they no longer distribute it? Or does she just say my assailant? She gave him a pseudonym. So he's Gregory Madison in the book. The okay. reason I know is because I reread the entire book, yeah. the, uh, not the other day, when I was mm-hmm. writing this, I was like going to parts of the book and I was like, forget it. I'm just going to read the whole thing over again. Yeah. So I read it. Yes. She gave him a pseudonym, but he was publicly identified. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, you know, and we, we now know it's a, it's a true story based on her memoir. So it's not yep. the true story. It's well, it. it's her true version, but yeah. I would be very curious. I I, sincere, I would love to see a rewrite, but I also mm-hmm. know that that might be very, very hard for her to do. Well, she's also still a victim and she still has not received justice. That's correct. Because I'm assuming they've never arrested anyone. So she now has to live with the fact that somebody was wrongfully convicted and the person who harmed her is potentially still out there somewhere. That's right. Her true attacker has not been caught, but could still be caught and hopefully will be. As for Anthony Broadwater... Shortly after his exoneration, he sued the state of New York for wrongful imprisonment and was awarded $5.5 million for the settlement in 2022. Good for him. He and Elizabeth still live in Syracuse and hope to buy some land with acres and acres. So that's where we are to date. Now, all the systemic issues and coming back to the questions that Emma had. She suggested it. She brought off some of these issues we've discussed, but I want to discuss a few of these topics. Unfortunately, the system failed in a huge way in this case. And there are a couple of reasons why. This is a case of a wrongful conviction that had a few problems. So first of all, hair analysis, as we said, has long been debunked. 
as it is not reliable, it's not consistent, and that was the only piece of physical evidence that actually connected Anthony to Alice's attack. That's considered a junk science, you said, Amy? Yes, it is. It seems like a lot of what, you know, a lot of these disciplines that we believed were scientific are junk sciences. What is still considered reliable science? I know, you know, DNA for the most part. I, I want to say fingerprinting for the most part, maybe ballistics. Fingerprinting. I know fingerprinting is really. subjective, but it's scientific mm-hmm. in terms of the match points. It's not a junk science, that's for sure. It's not a junk science, but it has been it's it has been used as a junk science by if the person analyzing is using junk quote junk techniques. So what is what, what are the reliable sciences as of now? Or have they just all been updated? Like we know, I know that arson investigations, they used to call them a science, but it wasn't science. Now yeah. arson investigations are scientific and then they replicate the conditions and have, you know, findings mm-hmm. um, so that they are scientific. We also have technology now that we didn't have then. So now we have cell phone pings and, you know, you can check people's alibis. There's surveillance cameras everywhere. So I think that's kind of taking the place. But of course, you have DNA and, you know, blood typing, mm-hmm. um, Okay, you know, alibi, eyewitness testimony, informants, confessions. All of these are still used. I think the issue, as we see in this case, is when you're using one piece of evidence without corroborating evidence. So an eyewitness sure. identification, in my opinion, should always be corroborated. There should always be corroborating evidence in the sense that I don't think anyone should be convicted solely on one person's eyewitness testimony. Sure. I would like to point out as well, the a side issue here, the lineup identification was incorrect. And we know also that lineup identifications, you know that lineup identifications of those across races or across racial identification is, it's highly problematic. Isn't that correct? Isn't there a much higher percentage of incorrect identifications? Yeah, particularly when you 